Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for chapter six. This is about the energy principle. And first we need to know what the heck the energy principle is. It's that the change in the energy of the system is equal to the work done on the system by the surroundings plus the thermal energy transferred from the surroundings to the system. Let's look at that. The change in the energy of the system is going to be the, the change in all types of energy that are considered part of the system. So remember, in any problem, you've got to separate the system and the surrounding and the surroundings. And uh, the energy is something you can calculate if you know the position and velocities of all the particles in the system. And we'll, we'll, that's a lot of what this chapter is about. So we'll, we'll get into how you actually do that. But that's the idea. Work is something we need to define, but the point is the surroundings can do work on the system and doing work changes the energy of the system. So uh, that's the idea of that. And finally, although we're not going to do much with this in chapter six, it's worthwhile to point out that you can also change the energy of the system by having thermal energy flow from the surroundings to the system due to temperature differences between the system and the surroundings. So that's something we'll hit more a little bit later in the course, but I wanted to make sure we got it in now since it's uh, an important part of the energy principle. The simplest case is if you have a single particle. If you have a single particle that's not interacting with the, well, no, if you have a single particle and that's all there is that's in the system, everything else is in the surroundings, then the energy is easy to compute. It's just gamma mc squared. You can see if the particle is at rest, gamma is equal to 1, and you get the rest energy, mc squared. If you have a particle in motion, then in addition to the rest energy, you get kinetic energy, which is the energy a particle has by virtue of the fact that it's moving. And you can see that that just turns out to be gamma minus 1 times mc squared. Kinetic energy, as I said, is the energy a particle has because it's moving. This purely as a consequence of its motion. So for example, if you have a proton that's moving with a gamma of 4, um, its energy is going to be 4 times its rest energy, 4mc squared. But th uh, 3 fourths of that, 75% of it, is going to be kinetic energy. So its kinetic energy is 3 times its rest energy. And uh, <clears throat> you can see that as the, as the speed becomes low, you can use a sort of binomial expansion of gamma. Uh, gamma turns out to be 1 plus a half of v over c squared in the low speed limit. And, uh, there, and in that limit, you can then see that the kinetic energy is just 1 half mv squared. If you've taken physics before, this is probably the definition of kinetic energy you used. And this is perfectly fine as long as the speed doesn't get close to the speed of light. And you can see the total energy then is the rest energy plus 1 half mv squared. Now, what if you have, uh, if you want to relate energy and momentum, you know that the energy is gamma mc squared, but the momentum is gamma times mv. So you can see that uh, <coughs> momentum, let's see, how would we do it? Momentum times c squared plus the rest energy squared is equal to the total energy squared. If you look at this expression and also look at the expression before, you can convince yourself that this is right. And then you can find a new way to compute the kinetic energy, which is the squared momentum over gamma plus 1 times the mass. In the low speed limit, this reduces to p squared over 2m, but it's p squared over gamma plus 1m in general. So. Uh, so that's the way that works. <clears throat> now what about work? How do we compute work? Work is something you calculate based on force and motion. So if you have a force that acts while a particle is displaced by a distance uh, displacement delta r, the work is simply the dot product of the force vector and the displacement vector. And I'm going to define dot product as a, a way to multiply two vectors together where you take the products of the corresponding components and add the products together to get the result the result in dot product. So we've got the x component of f times the x component of displacement plus the y component of f times the y component of the displacement plus the z component of f times the z component of the displacement. <coughs> so literally uh, 
If we have a force, for example, of 3 comma 3 comma 0, and you have a displacement of 5 comma 0 comma 0, to calculate the work, you'd take 3 times 5 plus 3 times 0 plus 0 times 0, and you'd get 15 newton meters of work. We're going to define a newton meter to be a joule, so that's easy enough to do. Now, what is it with the dot product? The neat thing about the dot product is that the result of computing the dot product is independent of the coordinate system that you pick. And that means that we can pick any coordinate system we like. So if we happen to pick a coordinate system where one of the vectors points in the x direction of our chosen coordinate system, then you can see that the x component of that vector is going to be non-zero, but all the other components will be zero. The x component of the other vector, a, will be a, uh, the magnitude of a times the cosine of theta. And so one immediate consequence of that is that, <coughs> that one way to compute the dot product of two vectors is to take the product of their magnitudes times the cosine of the angle between the two. So uh, what that boils down to is there's two ways to calculate dot products. You can take the product of the components and add, or you can take the magnitude of the two vectors multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. Well, now what happens if I have a non-constant force? Well, the answer there is I break the motion up into pieces I can calculate the work done along the first piece, then switch to the different force, calculate the work done along the second piece, and add the two works together. So the, the short answer is you break the path up into chunks, and each chunk you take the force acting on that during that chunk, dot it into the displacement for that chunk. And you do that as many times as you have to to get an accurate estimate of the work. If the force varies continuously, you can take the limit as the size of the chunks goes to zero, and then the work becomes an integral. And we did an example of that in class on Friday, but uh, that's sort of the mathematics of how that goes. And that brings up the notion of potential energy. So what the heck is potential energy? Potential energy is a kind of energy that you need in order to take into account interactions between multiple particles in the system. So if I include more than one particle in the system and they do work on one another, the potential energy keeps track of that work. So here's the idea. Let's say I, uh, I have a system where the kinetic energy changes and Part of that comes from work done internal to the system, and part of it comes from work fr on the system by the surroundings. The notion is I define the uh, internal work done as the negative of the change in the potential energy. In other words, I treat changes in, in work done by particles inside the system as being a change in internal energy and then I move that delta u to the other side of the equal sign because I'm going to incorporate that into the energy of the system and that then becomes the work done on the system by the surroundings. In other words, I'm, I'm just shifting work internal to the left side of the equal sign. It'll then be minus work internal and I'm defining minus work internal to be the change in the potential energy. So basically potential energy is just a way to keep track of work done by particles that are in the system on each other. <clears throat> okay, so that means the total energy is now going to become the total rest energy of all the particles plus the total kinetic energy of all the particles in the system plus the potential energy, the interaction energy between all the pairs of particles in the system. So I've tried to write this out. It's the potential energy between particle 1 and particle 2, between particle 1 and particle 3, particle 1 and particle 4, dot, 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 plus the interaction energy between particle 2 and particle 1, plus particle 2 and particle 3, and dot, dot, dot. And so you enumerate all the pairs of particles in the system, and you add up their potential energy of interaction. And the general rule is that particles don't have interactions with themselves, so you don't have a potential energy of a particle with itself. Um, <coughs> is it? Okay. So um, you can kind of think of potential energy as stored work. So the idea is 
uh, in order to get the system the way it is now, the surroundings had to do some work, or some some work had to be done, I guess, um, to bring particles together or set them up the way they are. And so you could sort of think of potential energy as uh, the work done to get things set up. And uh, it's sort of the work needed to uh, put things in the configuration that they happen to be in at this moment. And so it's kind of a stored work. It's a stored energy that you can get back by allowing the particles to relax to some other lower energy configuration that you that energy is available to do work in some in some fashion and the other thing is uh, it's often convenient to define potential energy so that it's zero when particles are separated an infinite distance now we sometimes violate this for convenience um, so for example when we define the potential energy of an elastic spring say or if we're working always near the surface of the earth uh, it's convenient to just say well if we're working near the surface of the earth we're going to pick some other zero of potential energy but uh, i want to point out when we get to the expressions for potential energy that uh, a lot of the fundamental forces produce potential energies that go to zero when the particles have infinite separation. And we'll see how that works here in a moment. So, so let's look at the, uh, some examples. If you calculate the work needed to stretch a spring from equilibrium, it turns out to be 1 half ks squared. Now that's relative to the unstretched condition of the spring. So if the spring is unstretched, you could think of it as having a baseline potential energy. Um, <coughs> And then if you stretch it relative to that unstretched condition, it takes an amount of work, 1 half ks squared, and so its potential energy in that stretched condition will be, or compressed condition, will be 1 half ks squared. Now, I want if you go back to my original statement that the potential energy is zero only when particles are at infinite separation, I could take the atoms of the spring and send them all out to infinity, and that would... Um, give me a true zero of potential energy. But that's um, that's not really super convenient if I all I'm interested in is whether this what happens to the potential energy of the spring relative to the condition when it's just sitting there unstretched. So we're gonna so I put a relative in parentheses here to point out that this is this one does not go to zero when the atoms are in infinity, but it is zero when the spring is unstretched. So that's, uh, and that's convenient for like using springs in the laboratory and that sort of thing. Um, the gravitational potential energy between two objects, this one does go to zero at infinity. You can see if I put in the distance between the two objects is infinity, this potential energy goes to zero. So this is relative to infinite separation. Then we've got a electrical potential energy. Uh, this is sort of, similar to the gravitational potential energy except using Coulomb's law. This one, as you can see, also goes to zero at infinity. And uh, if we're using gravitational potential energy only near the Earth's surface, we don't go far from the Earth's surface, excuse me, we can use the approximate relationship, uh, relationship uh, mgy, where y is zero at some relative zero of the potential energy. So we can what it boils down to is you can pick the zero of potential energy wherever you like. Many of the formulas that we use choose the zero at infinite separation, but sometimes it's convenient to pick a different zero, like for the example of using the elastic potential energy of a spring or the gravitational potential energy near the Earth's surface. Um, it's awkward to always refer to R equals infinity when you're just talking about a mass that's going from the tabletop to the floor, something like that. So by doing some worked examples in class, I hope you'll get some experience with this and you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, the last thing I want to discuss is the notion of an energy diagram. An energy diagram is just an easy way to sketch out what's going on with the energy. So here's an example where two stars are falling together and we want to look at the kinetic energy, the potential energy, and the total of kinetic and potential energy as a function of the distance between the stars. Now, notice this is a, 
uh, the horizontal axis here is distance. So as the stars get closer together, we're going to move from right to left. And you can see that the potential energy falls, the kinetic energy increases, but the total of the two, the sum of the two, kinetic plus potential energy, remains constant. And what that means is because the stars are falling in toward one another, the surroundings is not interacting with the two stars. So no work is being done by the surroundings. And that means that the change in the energy of the two-star system is constant. That means that if the potential energy of the two-star system goes down, then the kinetic energy of the two-star system has to go up, keeping the sum of kinetic and potential energy constant. That's kind of the idea. Um, let's look at another one. Here's, here's one where two protons are falling together. Um, and we're going to graph the same thing, the kinetic plus potential energy. The difference here is that as the proton separation increases, the potential energy uh, decreases. Remember, in the gravitational case, when the, when the separation increased, the potential energy increased. Here, if the separation increases, the potential energy decreases. So the kinetic energy has an opposite relationship. As the two protons approach one another, the potential energy increases, but the kinetic energy decreases. That's the idea. So they slow down as they get closer together, and that's consistent with a repulsive force. Uh, once again, if the two protons don't significantly interact with the surroundings, then the sum of the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is going to remain constant. Same idea. And uh, what about a bound system? That would be like the Earth going around the Sun, or an electron going around a proton, or something like that. In that case, <coughs> what you have is a kinetic plus potential is l less than zero. And this, this is for an attractive case. Um, the kinetic plus potential energy are less than zero. And what that means is, as the separation between the two objects increases, the kinetic energy is going to decrease, but the kinetic energy cannot decrease below zero. So what that means is there's a maximum separation that these guys can have, uh, because if you increase the separation beyond the point where the kinetic energy can be positive, the thing will turn around and go back. So you end up with what's called a bound state, and the point at which the kinetic energy goes to zero is called a turning point of the system. So we'll see this with um, oppositely charged charged particles. We can see this with gravitational systems, and we can also see it with things like masses connected to springs. So we'll look at examples like that um, and get some experience with those things. So um, the last thing I want to say is that uh, y to develop a little intuition about what's going on, you might imagine um, that if if you have a potential energy graph as a function of position, and you want to know what's going to happen to the system at, at different values of different values of r in this case, for example, or different values of position, um, the uh, one one way to think about it is if I just imagine setting down a marble on this surface, uh, where the surface is sloped downward to the right, the particle is going to move to the right. If the it's going to experience a force to the right. If I put it down in a region where the slope is upward to the right, the particle, if I set it down in that place, you can imagine, it's going to experience a force to the left. And if I put it at a point where the um, slope is zero, then it will have no tendency to go right or left. If the slope is, if the curvature is upward at that point, it'll be a minimum, and that means the particle will sit there stably. If uh, the, the curvature is downward and there's no slope, that means it's an unstable equilibrium. If I put the particle there, and any small change will cause it to either go to the right or to the left. So uh, that's a crude sort of visual technique to kind of get a sense of what's going on. It's not exactly right, because if you actually stick a marble on a hill, it's more complicated because the thing's going to move in two dimensions, first of all, and it's going to roll and do other things that uh, we haven't really even gotten to yet. But just as a kind of a gut feeling of what's going to happen to something that's in a potential of a particular shape, you can, you can use that as a starting point, at least. I also want to point out that there's a direct connection between the slope of the potential energy function 
and the force. And you can see it comes back to the definition of work and what potential energy means. Um, but uh, basically, the negative slope of the potential energy is the force. And uh, we're going to use that in, in some of the examples. I, I lied. I did have one other thing I wanted to discuss, and that's the notion of mass. So if you have a multiple particle system, the total energy is going to be the sum of the rest energy. So let's say we have a bunch of identical particles. So it's n times the rest energy of one particle, plus the sum of the kinetic energies of all the particles, plus the sum of all the potential energies of interaction of all the particles. That's going to be the energy. But we also know that Einstein has this relationship that uh, E equals mc squared. Now that's the rest energy of a multiparticle system. So if I have a multiple particle system where the total momentum of the entire system is zero, that means that the uh, velocity of the system as a whole is zero. So the system as a whole is at rest. So that would mean it would have its rest energy. And uh, the point is that Einstein tells us that the mass of the system times c squared is its energy. But we also know the energy can be expressed in this other more complicated way involving the rest energies of the individual constituents of the system plus their kinetic energies plus their potential energy of interactions. And uh, the question is which of these is right? And the answer is they're both right. They are both right. Um, they're just different ways to look at the same thing. So when you say a particle has a certain rest energy, but in reality that particle has constituents, subparticles that make it up, then that rest energy that you're using is actually uh, includes all the different flavors of energy that are going on in the, in the system of that particle. Anyway, that is truly the end. We'll see you guys next time.